Good morning and peace be with you. Welcome to our online worship service here at Divine Savior Church in Siena, Texas. Glad to have you with us this morning. And I pray that our time together in worship and reflection on God's word would truly be a blessing for you in your walk of faith. I want to say a special welcome to our mothers out there and wish you a happy Mother's Day. You truly are gifts from God and we're going to keep you in our prayers today that God would continue to bless you in your special and unique calling. I also want to say a special welcome to any visitors that we might have with us this morning. Glad to have you on board as well. I want to encourage all of you, both visitors and members alike, to take a moment to, to greet one another virtually. Uh, let your family in Christ know that you're here, and you can do that using that chat function that you should see on the right uh, side of your screen assuming you're not in full screen mode, of course. So today is the fifth Sunday of Easter, and during this Easter season, we've been going chapter by chapter through the book of Daniel. And we've been doing that with that theme, There's Another in the Fire, a theme that recalls that wonderful story that we heard about actually last week in chapter three, where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace because of their conviction to remain faithful to the true God. And yet when King Nebuchadnezzar and others looked into that fire, they saw another in the fire. And that story and that theme that's uh, throughout the book of Daniel reminds us that God is there with us even in the toughest of trials. Jesus Christ our Lord is alive, he is risen, and he has promised to be with us to the very end of the age. Today, as we move into Daniel chapter 4, we see that theme, there's another in the fire, even when we think we don't need him to be, even when we think we don't need his help. Well, let's go ahead and get started with our worship this morning, and we do so with a, a hymn. The hymn is, His Kingdom Reigns Forever, and that's a thought that actually is expressed by King Nebuchadnezzar, that we're, as we're going to see in uh, Daniel chapter 4 in a little while. So we have the hymn, His Kingdom Reigns Forever. We see the writing on the wall The kingdoms rise and they may fall Our God is King above it all strikes again His kingdom reigns forever His kingdom reigns forever when He was beaten fallen down with scoffers circled all around Still the king who sets us 
Just an empty seat. They'll find a seat at Jesus' feet. His kingdom reigns forever. His kingdom reigns forever. His kingdom reigns forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive our sins. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin for faithless worrying and selfish pride for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. People of God, Christ has died. Christ is reason. Christ will come again. And in his great mercy, God has made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. As a servant of Christ, I announce to you, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joys of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning is a gospel reading, it comes from the very last portion of John's gospel, so John chapter 21. And we hear in this reading about what we call Peter's reinstatement. So you may remember that, that Peter denied Jesus three times when Jesus was arrested, denied knowing him, even though Peter had made that strong uh, confession of faith that he was going to not deny Jesus and suffer all even death rather than do that. But you may remember that he did deny Jesus and even looked Jesus in the eyes and, and felt terrible about that, of course. But here now in this account, we see Jesus restoring him and then letting him know that, uh, that he is forgiven and that Jesus uh, letting him know that he still has a purpose for him, a mission for him to do, a mission that might even uh, entail martyrdom for Peter. So we hear from John's, 21st, uh, John's Gospel, the 21st chapter. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, 
take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you're, you dressed yourself and, all, and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the brothers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. This is the Gospel of our Lord. As I mentioned at the beginning of our service during this Easter season, we are going through the book of Daniel. And this morning we find ourselves in Daniel chapter 4. Now I'm not going to read the whole chapter right up front here at the very beginning. I'll be reading portions of the text and summarizing some other portions of the text uh, as it's appropriate during uh, the, the message that I give you today. But I, I did want to let you know we're in chapter 4 if you want to get your Bible out and have that in front of you or if you want to use that Bible text functionality on the right side of your, of your screen and follow along that way. Before I begin, would you please join me in a brief word of prayer? Lord, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, 
my two-year-old grandson, Christian, oftentimes does not like to be helped. I think his mentality may be that his older brother, if his older bro- he sees an older brother doing something without any help, then by golly, he's going to do it without any help. And he will swat you away like an annoying mosquito, you know, if you try to help him when he doesn't want it. You know, maybe it's trying to get some messy spaghetti onto his fork and somehow navigate it to his mouth instead of his uh, shirt or, or table, uh, a trick which I still have yet to master. Maybe it's trying to climb a, a big structure on the playground that's bigger than he is. Uh, the other day I was out with him at a park area and he was on his little, a little push bike and, and wanting to go up kind of a steep hill that I, I think must have seemed like a mountain to him. And so being the awesome, nice grandfather that I am, I went up to try to kind of help push him up the hill. And sure enough, yeah, he swats me away. Like, leave me alone, Grandpa. While it might hurt Grandpa's feelings a little that he doesn't need my help, generally I got to admit that I, I think a lot of the times it's probably a good thing. But you know as well as I do that it's not a good thing for him or for any of us when we don't want help or don't think we need help when we really do. And that's kind of the thing we're going to be talking about today here in uh, Daniel chapter 4. Except, of course, it has nothing to do with eating spaghetti or pushing a bike up a hill. It has something to do with something a little more important, like perhaps getting help with the salvation of our souls. So today in Daniel chapter 4, we, we learn this wonderful good news that God is with us, that there is another in the fire with us, even when we think we don't want him to be, even when we think we don't want his help. And as we go here, through this chapter of Daniel, we see very specific, specifically that God wants us to know that truth that he's there to help us, no matter who we are, and no matter what it takes. Now, Daniel chapter 4 is kind of an interesting chapter because it's a personal testimonial from none other than King Nebuchadnezzar himself. Most of what's recorded here are his own words, his very own, very personal story of of how he came to acknowledge that God is God, that God is king of kings with an eternal kingdom. And and through his very personal testimonial, we learn this first truth, that it doesn't matter who we are, God wants us to know that he's there to help us, even when we think we don't need it. So chapter 4 begins with Nebuchadnezzar's address to us. Uh, to introduce his testimonial. He says, King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders, His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. And then I'm going to skip to the very last verse that kind of summarizes his whole testimonial. He says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride kind of talking about himself here, those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Those are Nebuchadnezzar's opening words to his testimonial. Now, in in a little while, we're going to see this very interesting story of exactly how Nebuchadnezzar got to this point in his life where he could give such a testimonial, where he could give such acclamations and praise to the one true God. But I want to hold off on that for just a minute because I want to let it sink in who this is that's talking to us, who it is that's giving us this testimonial. I want to let it sink in that this is King Nebuchadnezzar we are hearing from. This is not a king of Judah or Israel, God's people. 
This is the king of Babylon. You know, Babylon, the Babylon that becomes a metaphor for everything that is evil, everything that opposes God in the book of Revelation. This is the king who went and destroyed the holy city of Jerusalem, who destroyed God's holy temple, and that only after ransacking it and taking out many of its artifacts and treasures, taking them back to Babylon with them and putting them in his own temples that were dedicated to his own gods. This is the Nebuchadnezzar who apparently spared neither the women nor the elderly nor the infirm when he went and attacked and destroyed Jerusalem. This is the Nebuchadnezzar that we heard about in chapter 1, who took Daniel and his three friends and gave them totally different names, names that would pay homage to his own gods, false gods, of course. This is the Nebuchadnezzar who you may remember threatened to, to tear limb from limb uh, from, uh, of his court officials just because they couldn't tell him what he had dreamed about. And this is the Nebuchadnezzar who we heard about last week who built this great statue of gold and commanded his whole nation that they would have to bow down and worship this, this image or else die. But this is also the Nebuchadnezzar whom God dearly loves, right? Right? This is the Nebuchadnezzar whom God truly wants to save. This is the Nebuchadnezzar that God wants to see in heaven. This is the Nebuchadnezzar for whom Jesus died. Maybe we could even say Nebuchadnezzar is the poster boy for that Bible verse that says God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Who is it that God wants to be saved? What did the text say? God wants all people to be saved. And that most certainly includes Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't it? And it includes all the others that we might put in the same category uh, as, as him. Uh, people perhaps like Rahab the prostitute in the Old Testament who helped out God's people and became part of God's people, even becoming an ancestor of Jesus. It includes people like the tax collectors and prostitutes and, and sinners that Jesus hung around with and that Jesus said were entering into the kingdom of God ahead of the so-called righteous Pharisee. It includes people like that thief on the cross to whom Jesus said in his dying breath, today you'll be with me in paradise. It includes people like Saul who made a living out of killing Christians until Jesus called him to be a missionary. I suspect you know John 3, 16, all right? What does it say? God so loved the good people. God so loved those who've dedicated their lives to him, those who have proved their worthiness to him. No, God so loved the world, right? And that most certainly includes Nebuchadnezzar, doesn't it? And of course, it includes you and me as, as well. So you and I may not be you know, kings over an evil empire. We may not be among those who promote, actively promote the decadence and immorality, who promote idolatry openly. We may not be prostitutes. We may not be people who make a living out of killing Christians. But don't you and I stand right alongside, hand in hand with Nebuchadnezzar, and all the others in the same spiritual condition before God as sinners in need of God's mercy and grace to get to heaven, in need of God's help? Yes. You and I are included right along with Nebuchadnezzar and all the others in that little word, all, when the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God but you and I are also included in that little word all when the Bible says, as I said before, God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. When it gets right down to it, to, when it gets right down to what really matters about people, you and I really aren't any different than Nebuchadnezzar, are we? And thank God for that because we know that just as God dearly loved and sought out Nebuchadnezzar to save him, 
So God dearly loves and wants to see us in heaven right alongside him. And that's the first thing that we learn here just from this fact that Nebuch it's Nebuchadnezzar who's giving this testimonial to us today. We learn from his testimonial that it doesn't matter who you are. God wants to get in that fire with you, even when you think you don't need his help. Now, of course, that's not the only thing we learn from Daniel chapter 4. Not only do we realize that God truly does want all people to be saved, no matter who they are, we also realize that God wants all people to be saved, no matter what it takes. And when I say no matter what it takes, that certainly means that God is willing to get into that fire with us. But do you realize it also means that God might be willing to, to put us into the fire, to put us through the ringer, so to speak. Nebuchadnezzar learned that God was willing to do that for him, for his sake. And that's the story of his testimonial, how God was willing to cut him down and put him through the fire that he might be saved. And so he tells us his story here in this testimonial, chapter 4. So once again, we find Nebuchadnezzar having a dream, just like a couple chapters ago, a dream that scares him and terrifies him. In his dream, he sees this great, huge, ginormous tree, a grand and majestic tree that's beautiful in its foliage, it's, it's abundant in its fruit, it's providing shelter for all kinds of birds and animals. But what terrifies him is that he sees a holy one, a messenger from heaven coming down and saying, cut down this tree. Um, cut down this tree, but, but leave, its, leave its stump and roots. And then this messenger goes on to say, let him, now talking about this as a person, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. In other words, have no shelter. Let him go live with the wild animals and, and have a mind like the animals. And all of this is going to happen so that God, they might know God as God. That was Nebuchadnezzar's dream that he was having. And he got Daniel to interpret it for him. Daniel says, oh king, I wish this was for somebody else, but, but this is for you. You are that great tree. You are a great and powerful king, but you're gonna be cut down. You're gonna be driven out from among people and have to live out in the wild without shelter. And you're gonna live like the animals and your mind is going to go. And Daniel says, goes on to tell him, says, but there's this stump, and that stump means that your kingdom will be restored once you recognize God as God. And so Daniel begged Nebuchadnezzar to repent and to renounce his sin so that he might avoid the judgment being foretold through this dream. That's where I want to pick up the story and, and, and read it from the text now. The, the fulfillment, what happens and what's recorded about the fulfillment of this dream. So I pick it up at verse 28. It says, all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, and keep that in mind, by the way, twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. And then Nebuchadnezzar picks up the story. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. 
Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. This is Nebuchadnezzar's very personal and very personal story of, of his conversion, essentially. Now, there's, there's no questioning that Nebuchadnezzar truly was a great and powerful king over a great and powerful nation. We see that through the pages of Scripture. We know that actually from uh, out, resources outside of the Bible. But we certainly see it portrayed here in the dream, too. The, the dream that God gave him, where God portrayed him as this great king, or this great tree. And I bring this up because I, I think it's worth noting that his greatness wasn't the problem. In fact, we know that from the very last verse where he says he came to acknowledge God and he was restored back to his throne and he became even greater than before. No, it's important to remember that his greatness was not the problem. The problem was that he was taking all the credit for it, wasn't he? That he was looking out over his kingdom and says, look what I've accomplished by my mighty power and for my own glory and my own majesty. The problem was simply pride, wasn't it? And you probably know that the Bible has a lot of warnings about pride. Pride comes before a fall. If there's one thing God won't stand, it's taking second place, especially not to us. And so, because of his sinful pride, God had to cut him down a notch or two. God had to, to strip him of his royal authority. God had to drive him out into the wild where he would live without shelter, live like the animals, and where he would go crazy. Essentially, God brought about his unemployment. God brought about his homelessness. And God drove him to insanity. And so I ask you, is that the kind of God you've envisioned? The kind of God you want? I hope so. Because what it shows about God is that he is willing to do whatever it takes to bring us to faith and save our souls. Remember the end goal that God has in mind. God wants all people to be saved. And he's willing to see that happen no matter what it takes. Now, mind you, God doesn't take any pleasure in, bringing, uh, in, in putting us through the fire and, and making us suffer a little bit. I, I think that's proven by the fact that God was giving Nebuchadnezzar this dream, this, this warning, that God was providing Daniel to interpret the dream for him and providing Daniel to, to beg Nebuchadnezzar to repent so that he might avoid the judgment that's being foretold in the dream. And, and it shows in the fact that God waited a whole year after the dream before he had to bring it to its fulfillment. God doesn't take any pleasure in that. But he is willing to do whatever it takes to empty us of pride and have us put our hope in him. And the fact that God did end up cutting Nebuchadnezzar down a notch or two proves that he is willing to do that no matter what it takes. Because his greatest pleasure is in the repentance of the sinner. You know, most of us, uh, I, I'm sure, under normal circumstances, would not take too kindly to someone taking a knife and cutting into us, right? But I'm pretty sure you'd be quite willing for somebody to do that. You'd even pay a pretty penny for somebody to do that if it were at the hands of a skilled surgeon who had to cut out a deadly tumor before it spread. In that example, we, we, we see that something so ordin that ordinarily would be so harmful to us, maybe even we would say is evil, could actually be for our good. Something that would save our life even. And the same is true for our souls and for that tumor of sin that lies within each of us. If left unchecked, that tumor of sin can have deadly consequences. And not just for this life, but for eternity. 
But thanks be to God that he is willing to take that knife and do a little surgery on us. That he's willing to do whatever it takes, just like he did for King Nebuchadnezzar. That, that he's willing to, to, to cut into us a little bit, to, to knock us down or a, a notch or two, to, to humble us in some way. That he's willing maybe even to bring a little misfortune into our lives, maybe even to, to bring a personal crisis into our lives, if that's what it takes to empty us of self, to empty us of all self-reliance, to, to, so that we might put our hope in him. It's kind of like what Peter said in his first epistle when he wrote to Christians who were suffering grief and all kinds of trials. Peter said, These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. People of God, the single most important thing you have, more important than gold, as Peter says, more important than your wealth, more important than your health and happiness, your family, whatever it is, The most important thing you and I have is our faith, our faith in Christ. And thank God that he is there to create that faith and help us keep that faith no matter what it takes. And if you still need more proof that God is there to help us towards our salvation, no matter what it takes, then just look at the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think I've said it before that I just can't imagine sending any of my children on a mission where I knew they would die. But that's exactly what our Heavenly Father did, right? And it wasn't as if Jesus went griping and complaining the whole time either. In fact, the book of Hebrews talks about Jesus who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Imagine that. Joy to leave the glories of heaven joy to be despised and rejected by my mere human beings, mocked and humiliated by his own creation, a joy to have a crown of thorns stuck in your head and, and nails driven through your hands and feet, joy to be forsaken by God. Yes, absolutely, because it would mean the salvation of our soul. Jesus took his call papers from God and said, yes, I will go. I will get in that fire even if they don't think they want my help. I will do it no matter what it takes. I'll do whatever it takes, even die for their sins. So this is the last we hear from King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, When we get into chapter 5 next week, it's a whole different king on the scene. So I think we can consider this Nebuchadnezzar's last testament to us. We don't know how long, how much longer it was before he died. We don't know if he kept this faith until his death, but it doesn't matter. What we have here is given to us by God through Nebuchadnezzar's own personal testimony. And through his testimonial, he wants us to know what he learned about God. And what he learned about God was that God is God, King of kings, the God who is with us, the God who will get in the fire with us and is there to help us even when we think we don't need his help. And through Nebuchadnezzar's own personal testimonial here, we know that God loves us so much that he wants us to know he's there to help us no matter who we are and no matter what it takes. And for that good news, all God's people say, Amen. Now may that peace that passes all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds in faith through in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Just as Nebuchadnezzar gave his confession of faith, so we now join our voices together and confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this point in our service, we're going to take a, a brief break and give you an opportunity to, to do a few things. Uh, you can make use of some of the functionality of our website. So on the top right of our screen, there is a link where you can make an online offering if you would like to do that. There is also the word connect, which is a link to, that you can fill out some information if you'd like to connect with our congregation or connect with Pastor Bivens. There's also a link there where you can make a prayer request. You're also certainly welcome to use the time in personal reflection on uh, Daniel chapter 4 and that uh, message that there is another in the fire with us. Also time maybe for some personal silent prayer. And then we'll join back here together in a minute or so for our general prayers of the church. We join in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are indeed King of kings and Lord of lords, mighty in power, awesome in majesty, and your dominion endures forever. Forgive us, we pray, for our sinful pride, for, for thinking that we are Lord of our life, that we are masters of our universe, uh, for thinking that all we have is because of our own doing. Lord, teach us true humility that we might never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, we give you thanks that you do truly want all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, no matter who they are. Remind us of that great truth when we feel alone and distant from you, when we feel like hiding from you because of our guilt, or, or think for whatever reason, think and feel that you couldn't possibly want us as your child. Help us remember, that just as you sought out King Nebuchadnezzar and promised paradise to the thief on the cross and, and called Saul to be your servant, even so your grace, love, and mercy are for each and every one of us. And when we do feel the chastising rod of trials and suffering, let us remember that even that is your love for us, a love that will do whatever it takes to build up our most precious faith. And may we then repent. May we then acknowledge you as our Lord and Savior. Today, Lord, we also want to give you thanks for our mothers and for all mothers. Give them strength and wisdom in their special calling that they might raise up godly children and through their love be shining examples of your love. And finally, Lord, we again ask that according to your will, you would ease the suffering of our time. Give us relief from this pandemic that continues to afflict so many of us, both directly and indirectly. But most of all, Lord, we pray that you would give us patience in our afflictions and an unwavering trust in your goodness and know that your ultimate cure for our biggest element of sin has been provided you have provided for the salvation of our souls through Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. And we join our hearts in prayer 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Once again, I want to say uh, thank you for joining us today and being a part of our worship. And I certainly pray God's blessings on you and, and pray that you might be comforted and, and take to heart that wonderful good news that God is there with us all the time, even when we think we don't need his help. Have a blessed week in the Lord. We'll now close with our final hymn, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Oh, my.